of what happened on Saturday with Marlon Kerner. We are live. We obviously have a special guest here, someone who really didn't even need an invitation to come back and join us again. Uh, Marlon, it's what happened on Saturday with you, but we're going to talk about Monday night, and then we'll talk a little bit about what happened the last couple days. Tell me where you're at, and then uh, Mr. Remersma, you, uh, you're you going to have the floor to, uh, to tell us how it felt Monday night. Well, Happy New Year, everyone um, who may be listening to this or who's watching now. Uh, I, I'm okay. Um, the sky is not falling in Buckeye land. Like, you know what? We lost three years in a row to that team up north. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I'm optimistic. I, I think if, if you're a fan of college football, you're happy. Uh, and so this is where I will put my Ohio State allegiances to the side for a second. And I will actually give propers to where propers are due um and look you can say what you want to say about michigan you can call them teeters you can call them whatever you want at the end of the day for those young men because i want i want to really hone in on this for those young men to stay focused from all the noise of should harbaugh be suspended there was a recruiting violation the ncaa says if you acknowledge it you won't get suspended i know i didn't do anything wrong he gets a three-game suspension. They win those games. They don't look great at, at times. Like, J.J. McCarthy had the one really bad game. We threw a lot of picks against Bowling Green. But they won. And then they got into Big Ten play. And then you get all these allegations of did they cheat, did they not cheat. You have one of your coaches leaves in the middle of a season. And then you get into this more and more drama. Then Harbaugh gets suspended for another three games <laughs> during the season against Penn State against Ohio State. I want to say, what was Michigan State the first one? Like, so you had the gauntlet of, okay, listen, if they can get through all this, through the noise, then get to the playoffs. You 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 had a hard fought game against a really good Alabama team, uh, and, and they dominated. Like their D line and O line destroyed Alabama's offensive line, and they they just really opened holes. So kudos to Michigan. I, I really I can't say anything bad. Because at the end of the day, they're 15 and 0. Um, they've done something that no team in the Big Ten has ever done. They won 15 games. They won it the hard way. Now we can sit up here and are, again. Some people want to put an asterisk. I'm not in asterisking or anything like that. But were they allowed to play? Okay. Then did they beat who they were supposed to beat? Okay. Then they're the champions in my book. I don't really have anything else to say. If the NCAA strips it or does something different, that's on them. But since they allowed them to play, then you can't sit up here and say anything different except for. Congratulations to that team up north, the 2023-2024 college football NCAA champions. Kudos to the maize in blue. Okay, Jay, are you happy? Is, is that is that okay? I'm done. I'm not now. I'm putting my allegiances back on, and I'm not saying anything good uh, about Michigan for the rest of it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, listen. The whole time you were talking right there, I'm thinking to myself, when is he going to go and spin this and and pivot and go positive? It's like, man, you're a typical guy from down south, you know, that, that team down south that wants to, you know, disparage the maize and blue, disparage the fact that, you know, we're national champions. You should live with that, Mark. <laughs> what gives in? I mean, let's face the facts here. The Michigan Wolverines are the national champion, the best team in the country, the best team in, in the Big Ten. And uh, our three and zero in the last three games against that team down south. Let me tell that you, is all it true. It is a great day to be a Michigan Wolverine. <laughs> so speaking <laughs> of that, speaking of that, Jay, you know maybe for people uh, who are listening who are Ohio State fans or you know from Buffalo, don't really have much of a connection to Michigan. Can you maybe talk us through what it means, you know, to you as a former player, but then to the fan base, to the alumni? Like, how big of a deal is this that they won the national championship? Well, it's a huge deal. I mean, obviously, when you get recruited at the University of Michigan, one of the first things they talk about is we want to be Big Ten champs and we want to beat that team from Ohio. I mean, those are the two priorities. Anything beyond that is just kind of, you know, icing on the cake, so to speak. And so, but that being said, the fact, as, as Marlon correctly pointed out, the fact that we went through such a adversity, perhaps – it is self-imposed, right? I mean, a lot of this stuff right. that's out there, we put on ourselves, you know, and, and that type of thing. And, and it needs to be litigated and properly looked at. You know, I don't think the rush to judgment that the Big Ten had 
with, uh, you know, some of the stuff going on is the right course of action. We can argue those nuances, but I will tell you this. This is as big a victory, not only for the University of Michigan football program, but for the Michigan fan base as there is out there, right? I mean, right. total adversity, Michigan versus everybody. You know, we're the leaders and best. Everybody knows academically, you know, we, we reign supreme. I mean, oh, now I'm really just ticked off a bunch of your fans. <laughs> but, and, you know, I'm, hey, I could say that jokingly. Why? Because I majored in football. <laughs> it's funny because I married a Spartan, right? My, my high school sweetheart, we ended up getting married. She went to Michigan State. I went to Michigan. And the joke in our family is you, you went to uh, Michigan State because you couldn't get into Michigan. <laughs> and then she's like, yeah, you couldn't get into Michigan if it wasn't for football either, which is true. <laughs> but anyway, it's as big a victory as we've had. Um, and it's it's one of those things that I'm sure it'll be litigated properly, right? And there'll be investigations ongoing. Right. But, you know, I don't know what happens, guys. I really don't. But, you know, let us celebrate this moment, Marlon. We Listen, I'm, guys, I'm all we on you beat us. Championship. You did what you were supposed to do. I, it wasn't trying to be disparaging. It was more of a, a compliment to the fact of how focused you guys were, like, through all the noise. The players came in week in and week out. And even when people like, oh, they didn't score enough points, they didn't do this, or they're just blowing out cream puffs. They did all those things. They still were able to handle the noise and come focus and 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 when the game mattered, right? Because we always talk about the focus that it takes to get ready to play a football game. But then there's a focus to stay in the moments of the game. And then there's another focus that you have to have when the game is on the line. Can you block out all the noise that you're hearing? Not just the crowd, just the what's going to happen if I don't make this play. You know what's going to happen. Like if your coaches are, are worth their salt, they're going to put you in the right positions, the right situations. They're going to say if they if it's third and five, they're going to run this play on offense. If it's third and seven, they're going to run this play. If it's fourth and one and they have to get a first down, they're going to run this play. But can you recognize it? Can you beat the blocks when you know – that you have to pick up one yard. And so I have to give kudos and props to Michigan because whether I like them or not, um, and and honestly, I'm old school. Like you and I come from the same cloth of I am I am a Michigan fan for every game that they play because I want them to be undefeated when they play us because it matters, right? So I want to be the one that spoils a perfect season for them and vice versa. So you always root for Michigan to win all their other games because you want them to be undefeated going into that game. But when you look at the adversity, the noise, the everything from not having your head coach to you can practice during the week with your coach and then he can't be on the sideline. So you're used to listening to, to him say all these things. And then when you need to go to look to him to say, OK, coach, what's the check here? He's not there. And you have an interim head coach. I, I, I mean, it was just amazing to watch. And and no, no disrespect. I mean, look, they 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 handled us like I, I'm not going to sit up here and say, well, if the tackle should have done this or like, no, look. You play the game on the field. They won when the final score happened. When the when the gun went off, or as the, as they say, the when the fat lady sang, that was it. Michigan three years in a row beat us, and there's some things we have to fix, right? Because you don't see Ohio State offensive line play that badly for three years where they get dominated uh, by the defensive front. So there's some things you got to fix, some coaching technique wise you got to clean up. But kudos and props to them because I was like, if, if it's a track meet. This kind of sets the stage for Washington, who that's what they like. They run up and down the field and it did like it was a domination. Y'all dismantled them. Y'all got after it. you didn't have to blitz a lot. I mean, you know, as a defensive back, people say, Will Johnson was clutching and grabbing and holding. I mean, did they call it? <laughs> it wasn't pass interference. It wasn't a hold if it wasn't called. So, I mean, it was an all around dominant performance by your Wolverines. Uh, and 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 by the way, Will Johnson, Demaris Johnson's nephew. So. I'm, I haven't gotten a text from him, uh, one of our former teammates, Jay, uh, but I'm sure I'm going to get a text from him about how they won it. They did it. Like, so it, it was just amazing to watch and kudos and congratulations. Cause yeah, I, I, I did root against you, but I only rooted against you because I didn't want to jinx you. I figured if, if, if I said <laughs> I'm rooting for Michigan, then and they y'all lost people like, see you jinxed us. So I was just like, I'm going to just root for Washington just to see what happens. But I'm happy. Um, either way it went, now that Washington is a member of the Big Ten, the Big Ten won. Uh, so either way it go, we were going to win as a conference. But, yeah, kudos. Like, I'll give you your props because, yeah, hopefully I don't have to say that next year. 
Um, Jay, Jay what did you much. see? What did you see in the game? Like, what was your takeaway from the game itself? And uh, when did you kind of feel like they had it in hand? Well, I, I tell you, I, you know, a couple things there, you know, kind of pivoting on uh, and back, uh, you know, you know, talking about what Marlon talked about, um, you know, it, it's interesting because I played with Dion Johnson, who is his, you know, that's his son, you know, at Michigan. And so uh, Demar- Demarius, right, played with us at, yep. at Buffalo and, um, you know, just a tremendous family, a football family. Um, but I want to piggyback a little bit on what Marlon said, because it's so interesting because we're taught as players to trust the process. Right. And those sometimes cliches get thrown about and you're kind of wondering how a team and the chemistry will react to that adversity. And I will tell you, you look at Michigan, what they went through this past year. I mean, it's week in week out adversity, overcoming obstacles, challenging opportunities in front of them and yet they responded and I think that that speaks to it was a senior-led player-led chemistry that just dominated not only the Big Ten but then all the way through the playoffs and I think when you have that chemistry as a player there's nothing like it for whatever reason the ball starts bouncing your way you know all of a sudden a hole doesn't get called and you get a big play on a on a, a punt return or a kick return or something like that. You don't quite understand how all that happens, but you know that we trust the guy I'm next to. We have faith in, in the process and what we've gone through and how we've properly prepared for what adversity is coming our way. And so when you're facing all this noise outside and you've overcome that, I, I hate to say it, but as a player, the game becomes almost second nature. It becomes easy, right? Right. And so a uh, defining moment, I'm going to tout him again because I think he's going to be a phenomenal NFL player if he stays healthy. But there was a moment at which J.J. hit Colson Loveland across the middle that I think broke the game wide open. And um, he was one of those guys that uh, heading into the Ohio State game, a game I said was going to have uh, a tremendous game and was a key to, you know, beating that team in Ohio. And uh, he continues to kind of produce. And I think – you know, of course, I'm partial, right? Even though I, I went into University of Michigan as a quarterback, I came out and and blossomed, I guess, of sorts in the NFL as a tight end. So I'm biased. The tight end's always open. I don't care if you put a corner on them, a linebacker on them, safety, doesn't matter. The tight end's open. Throw them the ball. And uh, so when he got an opportunity to break across the middle, I think it opened the game for us. And then we were able to kind of secure the victory from there. I actually thought about that. I thought about you when, when I saw that play. You're right. That was probably, you know, the, the, the play of the game that broke it open and, and kept the lead and pushed them forward. Did you uh, – where did you watch the game, Jay? Who did you watch it with? And who did you text, you know, before, during, and after? You know, that's also associated with Michigan. It's funny to bring that up because I stayed at home, watched it with a home with our family. Um, you know, Marlon knows me and, and how important family is. We're faith family and freedom in the Reimers household. And, you know, faith comes first, right? And it's important to have that as your, your guide stone. And uh, then family comes second. And so we stayed just together and, and, and watched it together as a family. And, um, you know, it's funny because right uh, at, as the semifinal ended, I said, Hey, I got tickets to the national championship. I was like, who's in, you know? And so I I pinged Delta and looked online, Grand Rapids to Houston. The night of the semifinal was 650 bucks. And Kara hemmed and hawed and said, I don't know who's going to watch the dogs. How are we going to make this happen or whatever? And the next morning, there were 2,400 bucks a piece. And so uh, we watched the national championship at home and gave up our to somebody else. (laughs) Not at that price. No, $2,400. Now I'm good. I think I'll stay home. That was just this. for the flight. Right. What do you think it was like on campus, Jay? You know, you see the afterwards, the the party. What's it like for a player, do you think, at Michigan, you know, coming home from the national championship? What's what's that week look like? Well, I can tell you, I never experienced it, so I don't sure. know. <laughs> but, you know, when we were Rose Bowl champs and ended up beating Washington and, and coming home and uh, I was a redshirt freshman at the time. I got my varsity letter from holding on extra point and field goals. And, you know, so I was, 
I was part of the team, you know, and all this kind of stuff. You know, it, it carries some weight. I think you recognize the, uh, the, the bigness of that moment, if that's a word. I mean, just the fact that you come home and you're, you're Rose Bowl champs and that kind of stuff, that used to be what it was. I mean, you, you didn't have the national championship per se. You went to the, you won the Big Ten championship. You went to the Rose Bowl. If you secured that win, then guess what? You were on cloud nine. And so I can only imagine what State Street and <laughs> – some of the some of the bars in Ann Arbor were looking like, you know, but um, you know it's a great feeling, and I'm and I'm excited about this team uh, simply because they came together uh, cohesively, and I think some of the faith component that I've talked about was something that uh, I know personally it was really important to a lot of those players. Blake Corn's one of the most solid Christian believers that you'll see out there. He gives back in the community like you've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And, and it's amazing to see that cohesiveness come together to um, just overcome some of the adversity they had all year. Okay, now let's talk about some of the game, right? Because you talked about the, the, the moment. J.J. McCarthy, right? Like, is he like, – there were moments in that game where I'm just like and, – and throughout the season where he made throws. I'm like, oh, my gosh, like I, I did not know – he had that type of accuracy and pinpoint accuracy. Like he put that ball on Loveland. I'm like, wow, that's a heck of a throw. He hit one on Cornelius Johnson that bounced off his chest. And like, if he catches this, he's running for a touchdown and he squeezed that in there. You know, some people talk about, there was a tweet that came out about him being possibly the greatest Michigan quarterback ever. Like, where do you think, he, where do you rank him uh, amongst the quarterbacks that have come through the Michigan halls and just kind of like, is, is he the best one ever? I mean, statistically record wise, he may be, he probably ranks up there as the top, maybe the best win loss percentage. Um, and, and what he's been able to do, the amount of victories he has, but where do you rank him? You know what? That's a great question, Marlon. And, you know, I, I'm not into comparisons per se, you know, I, I think from a record standpoint, nobody can argue with his body of work. Right. I mean, my goodness, right. he has just come in and won. And as a Michigan quarterback, that's how you're measured. Um, and so I don't want to take away from that at all. I will say this, um, and my wife and, and the rest of the family, as we watch games, um, I'm one of the biggest critics in kind of just the Michigan offense from a passing game standpoint. If you, if you study the game film, um, I, I don't think our offense is a pro-style offense per se. We don't spread the field horizontally as much as the NFL game does, you know? Like, I can remember going to the Buffalo Bills and even with the Pittsburgh Steelers, we would talk about, hey, we want to put pressure on all phases of the defense, right? We want to right. we want to stretch the field vertically. We want to stretch the field horizontally and that type of thing. And so some of the, the schemes, the passing schemes, kind of the patterns and stuff, look to me like they're focusing in on – we're running stuff and we're trying to get the ball to one guy. And, and so here's my assessment on JJ. I think he has all the ability athletically. He's got the skill set. He has the running capability to take it to the next level, which is now a dynamic facet of an NFL quarterback, right? Is to be able right. to run the ball in certain situations. Um, the question that I have, and I, it may just be scheme is, can he go through his progression reads? Can he go one, two, oh, check down? Can he go, oh, one, two are covered? Oh, I'm hitting my guy in the flat, you know? Um, right, right. But part of that, honestly, Marlon, is scheme. You know, you watch, you watch um, Michigan play, and they have a lot of vertical routes, and they kind of come in together. And if, if I'm looking at it as a quarterback, I'm looking at it like, my goodness, I, there's no separation between routes. And so – I, I have a hard time reading what it is that they're doing. And my only rationale is, well, they are forcing the ball to a particular guy. Now, is that because J.J. is incapable of going through his progression reads, or is that just the scheme that they have? We've seen some guys come out as receivers that I haven't really been that impressed with at the University of Michigan, and all of a sudden they – they blossom in the NFL and you're like, Whoa, I didn't see this in the NFL or in the, in college. So that's a long explanation. So I think it remains to be seen if that um, all the, the, the great things that we see in the college level can then translate to the NFL. That's fair. That's fair. I mean, I, I think Tom Brady might have something to say about 
if he who's the greatest quarterback from Michigan. But we'll we'll let that that can be debated in the barbershops and and have like conversations like this on on podcasts. Hey, and the irony is Tom was not a great college player. I mean, he won the national true. championship. Don't get me wrong, right? But statistically, right. you know, he had had to split time, and and you know, there's a little animosity there with Tom and Michigan because you know there's this this feeling like, well, why wasn't I the guy? You know, and they were splitting time. But you know what? Everything happens in life for a reason, right? Exactly. And I believe that that for whatever reason. Some, you know, the good Lord was shining on Tom and preparing him for adversity that he would ultimately face in the NFL. And he, he determined in the NFL, every day I'm going to come in and I'm constantly improving. I'm never the guy. How can I get better? And I think that's because of how he was prepared in college. And then all of a sudden you look at his NFL career and you say he's the greatest that's ever played. He, I would, yeah, I'm not going to argue with you there. I mean, the, it, it's the sad that he's from Michigan. Yeah. The sun's been shining on him for a long time now, Jay. <laughs> a long time. <laughs> let me uh, let me ask you about uh, your head coach. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think happens there with him? And if he does leave, is it a is it, is it a situation where you know Sharon Moore really kind of has to become the coach, or do you go outside the program? Because that'd be that'd be a tough that'd be a tough beat for Sharon Moore if he doesn't get the job. Yeah. And you know what? I've been busy the last couple of days. And so I haven't really followed where we are. Um, I think it's kind of gone radio silent. Right. I mean, they're kind of leveraging things. There's a few NFL teams that are interested. And I get that. It seems to me like Jim's always enter- entertaining NFL teams. Right. I don't know if it's just right. a way to leverage just a, a higher salary or whatever. Um, you know, a couple of things. Number one is I think it's telling that um, the University of Michigan and Jim did not come to a long-term agreement. I don't know the details. I don't know if there's more out there that either administrators know or Jim knows. And so they just don't want to lock into something long-term. I don't know if it's a bargaining chip by Jim to say, hey, listen, I'm going to ride it out. And I know that this $10 million or $11 million a year offers on the table. I'm confident in our kids and and what we can accomplish. We're going to write it out, win a national championship, and then I'm going to get paid. Or if he really just wants to jump to the NFL, because Jim's, um, I don't know if you follow his career, he's, you know, five years here, five years there and and jumping, you know? True. Um, And so I, I don't know. And, and as it relates to the assistant coach, you know, I would, if, if Jim leaves, I think you owe it to the Michigan program to open it up. You know, I'm, I'm sorry to, to say that. I think that you got to find the greatest head football coach you have with a, with a resume. And I appreciate what the assistant coaches coaches have done. You know, there was a couple of them that were interim head coach during stints when he was suspended and that kind of stuff. And all of them executed flawlessly. Now, how much is that? How much of that is because of the senior leadership and the players and the continuity that we had and the chemistry versus these are great offensive or defensive minds and they can administer an entire team. I, I don't know. That's a lengthy answer to say, I don't know where we go from here. (laughs) Stay tuned. Yeah, the coaching carousel is a little crazy right now. I mean, we already saw Saban. Um, to your point, I, I don't know what, what Harbaugh is going to do, but if you look at the NCAA, it's almost like cryptically you have to leave, right? Like when he's making little tweets like, hey, you know, I like black. Okay, what well, is that the Raiders? Uh, could that be Jacksonville? Um, could that be somewhere? Like, could that be somewhere else? Could that be Carolina? They have black. Um, so it's going to be interesting because I, I – I, I do like to read some of the conspiracy theories, but I will say the one thing that I noticed about Coach Harbaugh was once he started becoming a really big advocate for player rights, like, hey, you know what? We got to fix this. We got to do this. All of a sudden now the NCAA is like, we found a violation. Like, because you can go on any campus and find a violation of, did you give a guy a hamburger? Did you do something like if, if a guy, if I have a guy and I, I bump into him and he's eating food, am I not going to say, hey, what you eat? And I'll grab that. Like, no, like stuff like that happens more than we actually think about it. Uh, but it was interesting when he was just talking about the NCAA and saying we need to have a revenue sharing plan. And I was like, ooh, 
watch it now. He, he, They're coming after hey, you. Hey, hey, you, you, <laughs> they gonna get you now. So, so I think just to save the program, I think he would leave because there's definitely a target and a bullseye on his back right now. And I think there's a lot of people on the other side, the, the NC2A side that were like, we need to figure out how to get him and, and bring it and, and really silence him. So my, my, my thinking, as I like to predict is that he leaves um, and the NCA does nothing once the investigation concludes if he leaves and they'll give him like a five-year show cause. Um, and then he'll go off to the NFL and do well. And then in about five or six years, he'll come back to college or, retire right and at that point marlon like how much money do you need right i mean he's had a lengthy nfl career right he's as a player everywhere. as a coach yeah yeah it's like my goodness you know I, and can i go full-on conspiracy theory yes bring second? it absolutely bring let's it. go so another thing and i and i hate to bring it up unless um you know i might offend some of your listening audience but um I also think that he had a strong when Michigan came down and the legislature came down um, on the abortion issue and he was a staunch pro-life person and made some public statements and said, hey, if there is somebody that gets in a situation that they can't handle and one of my guys gets their girlfriend pregnant or whatever and, and doesn't have a solution, I'll adopt them. And it coincides with that and some of the things that he said about players rights and profit sharing and all that kind of stuff and so i think he had a big bullseye uh a target on his back and you know listen i i just appreciate somebody that actually speaks their mind and <laughs> right. says what they're thinking so often in culture today we just can't say for fear what what we actually think or or what our per deeply held convictions are because you're going to offend somebody you know what you can agree to something completely opposite to me and and marlon i love you like a brother that doesn't matter we just differ and have a different opinion and exactly. so i i totally agree with you i think once once harbaugh came out and publicly said some things boy he had a target on his back and you're absolutely right um i went to an nil uh, fundraising event for the beloved blue and, and it was a golf event and we were talking to Jim and I said, the irony here, Jim, is the fact that lunch today, you're serving cheeseburgers. <laughs> Isn't that what got you in trouble? And he, exactly. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, there's going to be infractions. I'm sure Ohio does the same thing. There, there are minor things because there is so much bureaucracy in this thing we call football and NCAA athletics somebody's going to do something wrong along the way. So I don't yeah. know what that means or what it looks like, but I will say I agree with you there because I think he had a target on his back. Do you think that he can get to be almost too big for college football? You know, he, we, Marilyn and I talked quite a bit about Deion Sanders and how, you know, Deion seemed to be running away from all of the old school college football guys who were sniping about how his process, how he was doing things differently and how kind of stodgy the college football world is. And some of these old school coaches don't like disruption and don't like change. And Jim, while most people would look at him and say, you know, he's old school, former player, whatever, you're right. He is outspoken. He's not of that mold of some of the other, you know, kind of cookie cutter college football coaches. I, it just feels like to me that he might be better suited now leaving on top and going to the NFL and, and, you know, just kind of leaving Michigan in a place where they're not chasing after him for the next five years for what happened this season. Cause man, the NCAA can be really vindictive, right? Yeah. And you know what? I, I totally agree with you. And I, I think, you know, one thing that I will say about Jim, he is as goofy as a day is long, right? I mean, I, I, he, he is an odd ball, right? I mean, he's sitting there talking about the confetti that's coming down. And, and people look at him and go, what in the world is he talking about? One thing that you will never, I think, question about Jim Harbaugh is the fact that he cares deeply about his kids. He loves his players. He loves football. He loves Michigan. And he believes in the tradition that is Michigan. And so those things are, are things that you can't point to and say, um, you know, those are problems or, or I struggle with that or whatever. Uh, some, of the, some of the noise, some of the external stuff, some of the things that you, you say, wait a second, that just doesn't jive with who I am as a, as a Michigan fan or 
um, a fan of college football or whatever, uh, nobody will question. And I think this, there's, there's really nobody, even transfer guys have come out and said what a great experience they had under Jim Harbaugh. And so he has a love not only for football, for his guys, that I think transcends kind of the culture today in college football. Um, you know, when I was uh, at the University of Michigan, I got recruited and ended up playing the first couple of years for Gary Moeller. He was kind of the CEO uh. of Michigan football. He was kind of a top-down guy, a leader. I love him dearly. He gave me an opportunity to come to the greatest institution around. But uh, when Lloyd Carr became head coach, he became a father figure and a mentor. And so that he had an open door policy. You could come in and talk to him. And, you know, to this day, Lloyd and I are still friends. I mean, there's something, there's this continuity. And that's the kind of love that Jim Harbaugh has for his players. There was a question in the chat, because I, I would love to get your, your answer on this, uh, where somebody asked, um, if the infractions turn out to be true, um, what do you think happens to the national championship? I will say... From my standpoint, I don't think anything's going to happen because of what the NCAA said the other day about they brought the infractions to light and they gave everybody plenty of time to, including Michigan, time to stop cheating if they were indeed cheating and give everyone else time to kind of change their plays and their and their their signals around. And they feel like they got the best team. I mean, they definitely look like the best team on the field. But if it turns out to be that the, the allegations are true, do you think they stripped the national championship or do you think they leave it um, if Harbaugh leaves? Boy, that's a great question. And I just don't know the answer to it, Marlon. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, first of all, if you have any notion that there aren't operations out there that are trying to steal signs. Um, I mean, my goodness, if you're dumb enough to be signaling with one individual, what the signs are in a particular play, you tell me, Marlon, wouldn't you be out there trying to take that? Absolutely. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I'd be trying to decipher it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, that's part of the game. That's that's part of the game. That's why you have one guy wearing a, uh, a, 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 a red hat and one guy wearing a blue hat. And you say, hey, this quarter, we're looking to the guy with the maze hat. We're looking for this guy in the second quarter with the red hat. He's the one that actually has the live signal. I mean, that's why – they go through these entire process on the sidelines to make sure that people aren't stealing signs. Um, the other thing that I would say is, do we actually believe, you know, um, a high caliber individual, maybe we could argue Jim's had too many hits to the head, been sacked a few too many times or whatever, a little quirky and that kind of stuff. Do we actually believe that he's dumb enough to be paying a guy to go out and intentionally steal signs. Come on. You know what I mean? There are, there are levels and layers to this that there's no way that I think the NCAA will be able to prove it. That's, that's my humble opinion. Um, but I don't, I don't know how far this goes. I, and again, it gets, it comes back to the contract negotiations, right? Right. It's like, right. if, if in fact, Michigan and the athletic department administrators have decided, Hey, we're going to put a pause on contract negotiations until after the season and the investigation takes place and all that kind of stuff. My thought is they know more than what they're letting on. And maybe Jim's just going to jump and say, you know what? I'm sick of this. I don't want any of this garbage. And I'm going to go be the next Raiders head coach and be done with it. I mean, he would look good in that silver and black. I, I'm not going to lie. I mean, with those Walmart That's because khakis. you don't want them in the maize and blue. That's <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Listen, I, I have said to you before, I have said on this show many a times, again, when, when Ohio State and Michigan are both good, it is good for the Big Ten. Uh, and so you want to see a great game. You want to see the end of the season come down to winner take all. Because that's what it was always like as, as a kid growing up. And when you think about Bo and Woody and, and three yards in a cloud of dust, it was always, for the most part, winner take all. And that's what people love about the rivalry and, and why people said, started saying this is probably the best college football rivalry is because of the fact that, man, how many times did Michigan spoil Ohio State season and vice versa? How many times did Ohio State spoil Michigan's chances to go play in the national championship? So, listen, it, it's one of those things where, you know, as much as, 
because I, I, I have to like I, I'm 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 a purist when it comes to this rivalry and and, and I know my record so I I don't get to come come up here and say well this and this and that because I know my record was against Michigan we didn't beat them so hey, I have I have a lot time. of respect I can't you got it once that's it that's all you're gonna get out of me out of that but <laughs> but I, I men give versus like boys. That. Yeah, men versus boys. Uh, we were definitely um, on the boys' side. We were boys to men. We were working on being men. And then we got Trestle that ran six off. And then we got <laughs> a pause. And then we had Urban come in and went seven off. So, yeah, we had a nice run with some coaches that kind of came in and really set the foundation. But, you know, that Cooper era kind of helped get talent coming to Ohio State because, you know, you started getting a lot of good guys. And he beat everyone else, just didn't have the right record against Michigan. Um, and I think a lot of that was also – mindset attitude the approach that you took with that that rivalry uh, and so it you really do have to get to your point earlier about finding somebody who understands the one the rivalry between ohio state and michigan but then also has the resume um, that want yeah. to make people come because the landscape is different like you're no longer just recruiting a guy and you're like i can develop him like you're going to the portal, you're bringing guys in. Guys are like, I want to win, I want to compete now. You may sign a five star athlete, and if he doesn't play enough his first year, he leaves. He's gone. Like this is college football free agency, and the players are. And I love it. <laughs> I think it it helps helps even odds because think about it. How many times did you come in with promise? You see guys like they promised me I was going to start this year, and he gets redshirted, and he's like, but he can't leave. He can't because the the team for lack of a better term, when you talk about NFL terms, the team holds his rights. They're not going to let him out of the contract, which they sign one year unless they get a better player to come in. Like, you know what? Well, we think he's better than you. We're going to go ahead and let you leave. So I, I love the fact that that the portal puts it back and gives the players some of the powers. But, yeah, you know, it's – it's. I'm going to go back to the purists. I'm, I'm a, I, I want to see us both good. The question I do have, because I want to go back and give some love, let's talk about the two running backs and, and how good is Donovan Edwards? Like, this dude just comes out of the woodwork from nowhere, and all of a sudden, bam, he pops off a 41-yard, it pops up a 46-yard, and you're like, where does this guy been? Because Corum got the bulk of the, 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 the carries this year, but last year he was hurt. So I'm just sitting there looking like, what, what an amazing thing to have a one-two punch with Corum and Edwards, and how good were they? throughout the season and in particular Monday night? Well, I think, you know, throughout the season, they were able to give each other rest, right? I mean, Corrin got the bulk of the workload during the season and that kind of stuff. But Edwards, to his credit, did you see the post-game interview with him? It was amazing. He, he was very humble. He was, he was talking about the team. He was talk, talking about Blake and, and what he meant to him, um, what Blake meant to, to Donovan and that type of thing. And, you know, this is this is what you want to see in any athletic event in life right. in general. Right. You want to see people when they get the opportunity, they seize the moment. And I think Edwards did that. Right. I mean, right. he sat there. I, I don't even know. Did he have 400 yards total rushing all year? I mean, it was it was pretty yeah. minuscule to what, you know, uh, Blake had. And yet here in the biggest state on the biggest stage in the biggest game of the season, all of a sudden, Donovan gets two breakaways, and he runs in. Of course, maybe that's part of the reason why he's not playing, right? He ran right up into the back of two offensive linemen, and the hole was like four <laughs> feet wide to the left. It took him a while to get there and bounce there, but when he bounced there, man, he just took off and showed that acceleration that I think is what you know will really uh, set him apart if he decides to go in the NFL. Now, he's got another couple of years to go, right? And so right, he can develop right. some of that vision. But, you know, Blake is one of those pluggers, man. You just give him the ball and you know he's going to get two or three. And we always we always in the NFL would measure uh, a running back by that, whether or not his head was pointing forward when he landed, right? Thurman right. Thomas was yes. the best in the game. I can't tell you how many times I missed a block and Thurman on the way back to the huddle would say, Mr. Block. And I'm like, hey, thanks. <laughs> because he would cut behind me and make me look good. Like it was designed that way. Thurman finished <laughs> runs and would have his helmet pointing north and south. Never got Always. pushed back. It was amazing to see, right? That's kind of Blake. Doesn't have that breakaway speed. He's probably got to develop that if he wants to really have a breakout uh, NFL career. He's got to have that top end speed, but he's a plugger, man. It's just kind of great to see these two individuals that aren't at odds or have tension amongst each other because guess what? They're putting the team above self right. 
Yeah, so just to your point, Jay, uh, Blake Corum had 1,245 yards, and uh, Edwards had 497. So, you know, Blake Corum was the workhorse and 258 carries throughout the year. An amazing 27 touchdowns. 27 touchdowns. Like, that's – the his nose for the end zone, and like you said, always falling forward. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a skill in and of itself, right? Like, that's kind of underrated – for a running back, you know, you, you see the sit, the size, the power, the speed. That dude's got like wiggle, and he's just got like that that always, you know, just always get two more yards out of a play and have twenty seven touchdowns in the college game. Pretty incredible. Yeah, it, it, it is incredible. And you know, the interesting thing about that is a lot of those touchdowns happened inside the ten yard line when everybody in the stadium knew that Blake Corn was getting the ball. Right? Right, right. It's like, how does this happen? And all of a sudden, you know, he. He'd bang, make a guy miss, and then he would power through somebody. He has great leg strength, great core strength, and would be able to finish those runs and get across the goal line. Great player. I'm looking forward to great things in the NFL for that young man. So am I. Um, Before we let you go, um, but I I have to ask because college football landscape is changing, uh, and we had probably one of the best to ever do it, say he's done with the game and Nick Saban. So – Talk a little bit about Saban, his impact on the game. Um, and and in your opinion, is he the best to ever do it? Or is there or would you say Bear Bryant? Because I mean they're both tied with six national championships. But you know, in your opinion, who who where would he rank? Is he in the top five? Is he one or two? Uh, in your opinion, is one of the best coaches to ever do it? I think Nick Saban is the best coach because he knew how to motivate young men. He knew, he knew how to assemble a group of individuals from all different backgrounds and get them to understand and focus on one principle. How do we win today? And I, I don't think there was a better motivator. I don't think there was a better person that could take an individual. And I mean, I've seen him bench guys early in the season. And all of a sudden, that individual at the end of the year is winning the Heisman. I mean, he is a, a, a tremendous coach, great motivator. I think he's a great technician. He taught discipline. He understands the game. One of the challenges that I would fit, put forward uh, for you, you said that, you know, the transfer portal has, has excited you to a level, right? I mean, it's one of yeah. those things. That's, it, yeah. yeah. And I think Nick Saban looks at it like, I don't have an opportunity to take my kid and then develop them for four years. That's true. And, and I think Nick Saban – and he's getting older and he's recognizing, hey, maybe my time is done, you know, all that kind of stuff. And God bless him. I think he is a great uh, testimony to what the uh, NCAA and athletics in general can do for young men and women, right? Give them right, an opportunity, right. earn a scholarship and position them to do great things in life. That's Nick Saban. I mean, if you look at what he's accomplished, it's amazing. So I, I put him up there. In my mind, he's the best that's ever done it. He's won at every level. He's won in different schools. And, um, you know, I think it's one of those things. And I think the transfer portal, if you have a guy like Jim Harbaugh that has come from the NFL and understands free agency, moving the right pieces, not necessarily player development, you might see somebody like Jim Harbaugh see some advantages with his NFL experience at the college level, because now we're turning college and guess what? Into the NFL and free agency. Yes, we let are. Me, uh, let me, let me get both of your uh, hot takes on this one because you know, they both uh, resigned basically on the same day. Who was the better coach in their genre or in their league, Bill Belichick or Nick Saban? Marlon's first. Marlon, He's you're smarter up. than I am. He it's your show, Marlon. Ohio it's State. your show. Go, Marlon. <laughs> Who do you got? One game to save your to save Earth. Do we have Nick Saban coaching college kids or Bill Belichick coaching uh, professionals? You know, I, I'm I'm gonna I'll, I'll take Nick Saban. Uh, and and the reason why I take Nick uh, Saban is not because I don't think Belichick was a great coach, but we've seen what his program looks like when you don't have twelve back there throwing the ball. Um, it, it's a little up and down at times. Uh, I think sometimes uh, his mentality, uh, he, he didn't necessarily always adapt his philosophy. Sometimes he stuck like this is the Patriot way when sometimes you could have maybe evolved, evolved a little bit, maybe lightened it up a little bit, maybe found something a little different. I thought Saban was always able to, to your point earlier, Jay, about, you know, like Jalen Milrow, like he benched him. They literally benched him for a game because he made some costly turnovers against Texas. They struggle in that game. He comes back and he's on fire 
and he leads them. And if he throws a swing pass, who knows if they pick up the first one or not. But if he throws a swing pass, now we're now we're, we we could be having a different conversation of what who was a national champion if he actually had the right read. So I think Saban has done a very good job of really being able to take and develop young guys and have that tough love. And then they really embrace him and then turn around and really come back and say, I'm going to embrace what you said to me. I'm going to take it. I'm going to fight. I'm going to compete. Uh, he did it time and time again. Uh, and, and I mean, the national championships speak for themselves, six of them. Uh, although Belichick does have six. So I, I guess, you know, you can, you could put them both on a scale and be like, look, I mean, you could toss it up. They both have six championships at different levels. Uh, but I mean, without Tom Brady, I, I, I think Tom Brady showed that he was also a really big reason as to why, that that Patriot way and that dynasty went around for so long is because he was at the helm. Uh, and when he went and won one by himself uh, down in Tampa Bay with the same roster that pretty much Jameis and Win Jameis Winston had the year before and Tom Brady takes him and wins a, wins a Super Bowl with him. Like, all right, look, 12 might be the best that ever do it. Uh, and so I have to give him props for that. So I'll, I'll go with Saban as the best coach of all time. Yeah, to your point, Marlon, I would agree. I think Saban, uh, by by a by an edge of this much, I mean, it's just it, it's phenomenal to see. And 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 say it once more. Where did where did Tom Brady go? Oh, that's right. Uh, oh, that's, that team that team up north. That Who's got north. it better than us? Nobody, <laughs> right? But I, but I will say this about a funny story. Going back to Belichick, I can remember when I was in Buffalo, we were getting ready to play the Detroit Lions, and you know the mantra in in the NFL is, you know, you don't look past that week, the next week, right? You're preparing right. for that next week. It's like one game at a time, all this BS at times, right? right. Um, <laughs> anyway, I get out there and we're going through the, the routine and I'm like, wait a second. Why, why are we going against a 3-4 defense? Because I know the Lions play a 3-4 or excuse me, a 4-3. Got four down linemen and three linebackers. And I get back to the huddle. My position coach goes, well, yeah, we're, we're not preparing for the Lions. You know who we play two weeks from now. We're going against <laughs> Belichick and his 3-4 defense. And I'm like, oh, now it makes sense. Now think about that for a second. We have come <laughs> full circle. The Lions are division uh, winners. And, you know, I, it's it's just funny to think that that's what's going on in the NFL today, right? But right. that speaks to Belichick and how he prepared his teams. Every time you would face the New England Patriots, you didn't know from an offensive standpoint what you were going to get. You didn't know if you were going to get two down linemen and a gazillion linebackers or seven DBs and two linebackers. You didn't know where they were coming from half the time. The yeah, he was definitely innovative that, on that defensive side. Yes, he was. Yeah, uh, the best advice that I got when I was playing in New England was – Hey, listen, trust the process. Whatever your step would have been, trust that step and hit whoever hits you. <laughs> That's literally what coaches would tell you because you didn't know where they were coming from. So, I mean, maybe that has kind of run full circle and Belichick's passed his time. I don't know, but I, I, will, I will say Saban, Belichick. Agreed. Agreed. That was a Saban, good answer. Belichick. One uh... One more for you here, Jay, before we go. We'd be remiss if we don't mention Sunday, uh, your two former NFL teams uh, playing each other. Maybe uh, let people know who, who do you cheer for and uh, maybe what do you think happens? Are, are you kidding me? There is no doubt in my mind who I cheer for. Um, you know, I, people often ask me this question, you know, well, you've had the, the opportunity to play for the, the Bills and the Steelers. What city's better? What fan base is better? Who do you cheer for and that kind of stuff? I will tell you, Marv Levy and Mr. Wilson gave me the opportunity to come to Buffalo. And at the time, funny story, we're sitting there. Uh, my fiance at the time was Kara, who I now have married. We've been married over 25 years. And I was too cheap, right, to have kind of like a, a draft party. And I knew I wasn't going to go on that first day. So I knew the second day and and I was Dutch. So Reamer smiled. What do you know about the Dutch people? The Dutch people, you, you go Dutch for lunch, right? I mean, <laughs> that means you pay your own way. So we're too cheap to pay for anybody. And so I didn't invite anybody over to my draft party. It was just Karen and I sitting there waiting to see who, where I was going to get picked. And it was 
towards the tail end of that second day back then when they just had two days for the NFL draft. And I looked at her and I said, "Hun, where would you want to go? And without hesitation, she said, she said, she grew up in obviously Michigan. And so she said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we went somewhere warm, you know, somewhere that has good climate, we could get out <laughs> and enjoy the, the weather and that kind of stuff. And about two minutes later, my, Got a phone call coming in. Uh, sorry about that. Mark, Mark Levy called and, and said, we're going to pick you in uh, draft number 244, and you're coming to <laughs> Buffalo. Can't wait to see you. So the Lord has a sense of humor. And um, Tara even mentioned, she goes, Any, anywhere but Buffalo, because you know what? The Weather Channel is always on location in Buffalo with a blizzard. <laughs> and I said, guess what, hon? We're going to Buffalo. And it is the best experience I could have ever had. There was such a Absolutely. great there was such a great group of veteran guys like Marlon that kind of took me under their wing and said, Hey, here's how you live this life as an NFL player. And it was the greatest experience of my life. And I will always uh, think of Buffalo as a second home. Make sure you come back, make sure you come back this season, next season. I will brother. That's uh, that's a great way to end Jay. That was uh that was amazing. Thank you so much for, uh, for your time and for giving Marlon a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of shit here, I did say during the chat Marlon was drinking a little bit of copium. I like to call it, you know, and trying to uh, you know all the nice positive words about uh, about the team up. North. Hey, listen, so- the season's over, so like Jay will tell you, like <laughs> we 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 always had the little all right. Listen, let's have a little friendly wagers, like who's gonna <laughs> win. But now we can just come back and talk. Like, listen, we're good. Like we don't have to worry about this for another three hundred and sixty something days. So I'm, or yeah, I, I have to look hey, at the counter. I, I just want to make sure that uh, your listening audience knows too. Marlon Kerner is a man of his word because we had a gentleman's wager that the winner of the Michigan or the loser of the Michigan Ohio State game had to put, you know, the other person's, uh, you know, what do you even call it? Profile. I'm not techie, but the profile had to put, on yeah, Twitter. I had to change my profile pic on Twitter. Yes. Yeah. And so Marlon, to his credit, I sent him a picture. And he said, hey, listen, that one doesn't fit correctly. You know, you got another one. He could have just said, hey, it didn't fit. Sorry, I'm sticking with Ohio State, you know. But to his credit, he put University of Michigan up on his Twitter page. And for I a week. To tell you, you're a for man a of week. integrity, uh, Marlon. It was so you hard to do that for a Michigan. week. No. <laughs> that was never going to happen. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, uh, Thanks so much, Jay, for your time. We really appreciate it. Love you guys. Take care. Congratulations. Congratulations. Go go blue. Oh, oh, I kicked him off there real quick. There we go. Sorry about that, Jay. I kicked you off real quick. Give your fist pump. And that was me, (laughs) not Marlon. (laughs) (laughs) Take care, buddy. All right. Have a great day. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too. Well, Marlon, you survived. I'm proud of you. That was a road game for you. That was a, that was probably (laughs) your best episode so far. That uh, that that you're a true professional in every sense of the word. Uh, you can't get mad at me like this. At the end of the day, we we joke. I, I love the rivalry. I think Ohio State Michigan is probably the best rivalry in all of sports, uh, not just college football. But you know, like it's it's a game at the end of the day. And these kids, they do a lot. They go through a lot. Coaches included. There's a lot of sacrifice that goes into getting to that level. So yeah, when I can give Jay a hard time, I will. But you know, when he can give me a hard time back, he will. Um, but that's the part of the rivalry. Like I, I've seen so many of my Buckeye brothers. Like, all right, a bet's a bet. I, I will honor my word because for a long time we had a long streak, and and I've won money off this game. Uh, don't tell the NCAA or anybody else, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, and I've had to change pictures. I've I've got pictures of people with Ohio State gear on that were Michigan fans, and that's the beauty of it. That's what makes the rivalry so much fun. It makes it so that. You know, you 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 become more invested in watching that game and watching this, and and it's a tradition you pass down. I I, I joke because my daughter always says, "Well, Dad, like, what if I had went to Michigan?" And I was like, "Well, you wouldn't have been my daughter." Like, <laughs> that. Like, I nice had to disown too, you after that. Like, no, not the happening. Night, the nice thing too about this rivalry is that you know that the pendulum's going to swing back the other way. You know, it's not one of those yeah. one sided, you know, big brother little brother rivalries. This is. You know, it, it's it's frankly good long term for the rivalry that Michigan has had the upper hand for a while now because it Absolutely. seems like for the past you needed, 15, you needed to swing years, back because they were they were not they weren't recruiting right right because everyone's like I'm gonna just go to Ohio State like Ohio State has almost ten in a row right there was I think what J T Barrett went and he went four and zero like there was two classes 
of uh, seniors at Ohio State that never lost in, in, the, in their four years at Ohio State of playing, never lost to Michigan, which I love. And I, I and I congratulate them. And, and they did some amazing things. But, you know, sometimes I, I don't like to see three in a row. Like I, I can see one maybe back to back and then you get back onto the winning side if you're a Buckeye fan. But you do need to see those little swings and those little blips where you're like, OK, um, it makes the rivalry. It makes people tune in. It makes people want to yeah. watch. It makes you want to kind of check and say what's going to happen because when we had that streak, people were like, oh, we already know who's going to win. Ohio State's going to win. And yeah, and you don't Michigan want it to turn into like, Ohio oh, State. No. You don't want it to turn into Ohio State versus Indiana. You know, right? Quite frankly, yeah. like where it's just not competitive. It's just better. It's better for college football. It's better for you guys. You know, and and you take the L every once in a while, and then the the, the wins feel you know. Listen, every once in a while is like one game. Like we <laughs> lost in a row. This is more than once in a while. We we've got to fix some things in Columbus, but. If you've been watching, a lot of guys have come back. I think Marvin Harrison announced he's going to the NFL, uh, but Denzel Burke is coming back. Uh, we've got uh, Eichenberg, I believe, is coming back. So there's some things that, you know, you've got uh, that that is going to be in, in Ohio State's favor. You're going to have some seniors that are going to be back there to add some continuity. A lot of five-star guys coming in and a new quarterback that they're bringing in. So I'm looking forward to seeing it. It's going to be fun as we get to the spring and talk about some of those spring games that we get to watch. And it'll be interesting to see what Alabama looks like and what the sure. coaching carousel and all the guys that Dion's bringing in and what their spring game is going to look like. Cause he has been an economic impact um, for that university and that community. No so, so, you know, I, and I think that's one of the things that, you know, sometimes people overlook is, you know, yes, college coaches get paid a lot of money, but when the program wins, it's not just, uh, something that the co coaches and the players now with NIL are getting paid, the community wins and and the and the businesses around the the campus and the businesses that support the campus and and the the functions that go in and out and some of the vendors that come in they can do some things and and even the off t-shirts that get made like those businesses start booming and people start making income when you have a really good football program so so that's why Buckeyes Nation is like look we got to get back on the, on the winning side because you can't have a letdown too long or else then things suffer. Uh, so yeah, I'll take, so a, I'll take a wild a guess. I'll take a wild guess that the endowment fund at the university of Alabama is much larger than it was the day that Nick Saban became the head coach. So I think, I think the university of Alabama probably did pretty well on the bottom line uh, Absolutely. You know, in his tenure there. So even though that he was underpaid, no matter what they paid him, frankly. Yeah. And I know I, didn't I know the president how, come out with a tweet. Did you see the tweet? I, I, I have to find it. I, I may retweet it on our, on our Twitter channel, but I want to say the president of Alabama came out when he announced it, just how, how, how much of an impact, yeah. That him being as a coach, just not only on enrollment uh, and the money's generated, but just I think they grew like 60 percent enrollment. They went from sure. like 20,000 in the 20s to like 40,000, almost 50,000 students because of Nick Saban. Everybody wanted to come there. They went from being just local, only people kind of from Alabama kind of wanted to go to school to becoming uh, a, this program that people from all over the country wanted to attend. I mean, I, I worked with somebody with the Bills who was like, I'm going to Alabama um, just because of the legacy that they had. So wow. it was pretty amazing to see the impact that he's had uh, and and what he's been able to do as being, being able to put just some really great football programs together and making people really fall in love with that atmosphere. Uh, and then people realizing that, hey, the campus is not bad looking either. One of, one of my former teammates, uh, Ken Urban, his son ended up going to Alabama. Josh Urban went to Alabama. So yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty amazing to see what they were able to do there. Um, and definitely they're going to miss it. Those are big shoes to fill. Whoever steps into that huh. program, those are some mighty big shoes to that fill. That might and, be the hardest. And I that feel for the, them. That might be the hardest job in the history of college football. Yes, You know, absolutely. you're going to get paid. You're going to get paid great. Your facilities are amazing. But, man, what I mean, what is the standard there? Like you, you know, you, you guys, up, you know, you in Ohio State want to run Ryan Day out of there after going like 27 and 5. I can't <laughs> even imagine – you know, what is the tolerance level going to be for the next head coach at Alabama? I just I, that, to me, that's the hardest job in the history of college football. You I mean, again, you, you we were joking and, and texting earlier and and there's a list of who may take it. I mean, you have to have somebody that has a college football resume, somebody that can recruit. Um, they could throw a lot of money at Dion. I, I think Dion at this stage of his career uh, might be a little bit it might be too soon for him to go there. He would need probably another couple years. He needs to win a conference championship with Colorado now that they're going to the Big 12 and, and see how he can build a program there, uh, in my opinion. Now, do I think he would be successful? Um, yeah, yeah, I think he would. Um, would he win a national championship? I'm not sure. 
um, because he would definitely he he's right now figuring out how to assemble the right staff, um, learning how to do all those little nuances that go along with it, uh, and 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 while also trying to be him um, as the personality of Dion, and then trying to balance being Dion with also being a head coach, and so that takes a little bit of time and some experience to be able to be able to juggle all those things, and and when you're at Alabama. I mean, you don't have that time. You don't have the time. Like it's they want you to come <laughs> in and win <laughs> now. Uh, so I thought yeah, got I thought him <laughs> jumping to Colorado was the perfect because he had time to kind of come in and win now and be able to develop program and get his players there. Um, and you were going to see an immediate economic impact, which we saw this season. A lot of what twenty seven million dollars. Like after the first season, they were up. They sold out all their games. Uh, they you know sold out their their in the first time of the history selling out uh, their spring game. <laughs> so, yeah. so their, the future's bright for Colorado as long as Dion stays there. And, and let's see if they can get the right players and, and become more competitive throughout the conference. Well, and I'm conference. just pleased. I'm just pleased that they're going to keep their hands off of, of my guy, Marcus, Marcus Freeman. <laughs> uh, my Irish are, are, are really, you know, on the upswing here. Year three. Yes, they are. So I'm really excited for what's coming next. My, uh, my new favorite quarterback, Riley Leonard. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm ready to go too. I'm excited for our show going forward. Please, everybody, like and subscribe to the Cover One College Football YouTube channel. Uh, Cover One is going to have a, a, a bunch of different shows on this network. Uh, you know, draft coverage. You know, Marlon and I are going to be on here. We're going to do a couple of different fun things, you know, throughout the winter and the spring. We're going to keep this rolling once a week. And I hope, hopefully, everybody enjoyed it, subscribes, likes. And uh, next year is going to be a wild ride. Wild it ride. Sure Even is. Better I than cannot this year. wait. It's going to be so much fun, and I can't wait. But, you know, uh, we, we we talk a lot about the college football, so I will just go ahead and end this with Happy New Year, everyone, uh, and go Bills. Go Bills. Thanks, buddy.